Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Logsdon. I'm the Executive Director of the Tech America Space Enterprise Council, and welcome to our forum on a day without space, our ongoing uh, uh, series on day without space, going back about four years now, partnering with the George Marshall <laughs> Institute. Today's focus is on day without space, the potential impact of sequestration on the space industrial base. Uh, we have a series of four panelists today. You're not only going to hear what you've been hearing around town at nauseum, but you're also going to hear the um, words coming from uh, two vets, two warfighters that have utilized space-based capabilities on the ground. So before I introduce the panelists, uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Jeff Keeter from the George Marshall Institute for a few uh, uh, introductory remarks. Well, thank you, David, and thank you all for being here today uh, to be part of this ongoing conversation about the importance of space to U.S. economic prosperity and to our national security. Uh, as David was exiting his, uh, for his preliminary introduction, he makes a very important point about how today's conversation is unique uh, amongst m most of the discussions one might see on national security space or space in general, in the sense that it will take you to the very granular, granular level to discuss how space products and space information is used by the individual. And that's one the continuing theme of our Day Without Space series is to try to educate the general public, and in, but in particular the policymaking community, uh, about how space is practically used. Uh, for our economic prosperity, for our national security purposes, to the benefit of the nation as a whole. David and I uh, strongly believe that that, only by viewing it through that framework, or, or at least helping uh, to view it through that framework, can we build the kind of constituency of support for the long-run investments in, in developing and exploiting the advantages of space that the United States presently possesses. So while sequestration is generally viewed as a, as a negative outcome, and undoubtedly, if it occurs, it will have tremendous negative impacts on our space apparatus, uh, both for commercial purposes, but also for security and intelligence purposes, I, I challenge you also, though, to think about the opportunity uh, that arises from the sequestration challenge. And, the, and in that sense, uh, it's informing a project that we're uh, working on at the Marshall Institute, the results of which will be released in September. The intent of it is to help devise a framework for thinking about investments in security space principally, but it could also be applied in other areas. Uh, the notion there is that you properly relate threats to missions, missions to technologies, technologies to systems, and then that then informs budgetary decision making that you might have. Uh, in that sense, then, it also would help balance how far we go in letting loose our space capabilities. And, and by that, I mean, what do we want to buy from the commercial marketplace? What should we keep inside uh, the U.S. government apparatus? How much should we let go out? And that, that's been a topic that David and I have hosted forums on over the years, and certainly those forums inform this activity as well. But if you're looking at a general situation where the, you think your budgetary environment going forward will be highly constrained, then this kind of thinking at the strategic level is certainly necessary to inform those very practical and specific budgetary line items. So with that, that that's, those are the opening comments that I have. There's more information about the Day Without Space series out in the front. I encourage you uh, to pick up those flyers, to view the videos, to read the transcripts. Uh, it's a wealth of information that you, as advocates for the space, uh, for U.S. space capabilities, can use to inform your colleagues. Uh, but also, hopefully, uh, you will uh, con converse back with David and I about ways that we can shape and improve uh, the dialogue as we move through. To the panelists, thank you for being here with us. David. And our fourth panelist will be here shortly, Leslie Gilbert. Uh, she had a meeting that she had to uh, attend, a mandatory meeting, but she'll be here shortly. Our first speaker today is Mr. Greg Keeley. Greg is the Tech America Vice President for Defense, Intelligence, and Homeland Security Policy. Recently returned from uh, deployment in Afghanistan where he was a NATO spokesman provided daily briefings to the commander, U.S. forces, and served as a personal advisor to the deputy commander, ISAF. Uh, previously, uh, he, 
He was the vice president um, at. Let me on here. <laughs> uh, he served as a number of senior advisory roles in the Congress, including spokesman and special advisor to the vice chairman for the House Armed Services Committee, chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, and a U.S. senator born and raised in Australia. And I won't go through the rest of the stuff, Greg. Our second speaker today is Joel Ahrens. Joel served in Iraq with the 1st Cavalry Division for the deployment to Iraq in 2004, served as an infantry uh, platoon leader in Baghdad and provided security for Iraqis as they went to the polls for the first free fair elections held there in the last 50 years. Currently serves uh, in the U.S. Army Reserve as a captain, holds the Bronze Star for his time in Iraq, was recognized by <laughs> Secretary, then De Secretary of Defense uh, Donald Rumsfeld as one of the 50 heroes in the global war on terror and has been profiled for his service in Investors Business Daily, Iowa native, and holds undergraduate and law degrees from the University of South Dakota. He's appeared on numerous uh, uh, news programs, uh, Fox, CBS, ABC, NBC, others. Uh, he currently serves as the chairman of Veterans for a Strong America. Our third speaker today is Mr. Stephen Bucci, distinguished Army Special Forces officer who uh, recently joined the Heritage Foundation as a senior research fellow for defense and homeland security. As a commander of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Special Forces, Bucci led troop deployments to Eastern Africa, South Asia, and the Persian Gulf, including Operation Desert Thunder in 1998. He also served as a leader of the 82nd Airborne and 7th Air, uh, Special Forces when he was tapped in July 2001 to become military assistant to uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. And he is a uh, pro professor of leadership at George Mason University and associate professor of terrorism studies and cybersecurity policy at Long Island University. And finally, we have uh, Mrs. Leslie Gilbert, vice president and Van at Van Skoyak Associates, where uh, our portfolio includes uh, organizations that are focused on research development and competitiveness in aerospace, cybersecurity, information technology, basic and applied science, and energy. Prior to joining uh, Van Skoyak, she was a staff director and counsel of the House uh, Science Space Technology Committee, uh, the folks that have generously offered this room to us today. Um, She's most noted uh, for her work uh, legislation on the NASA Authorization Acts of 2008 and, and 2010, and America Competes Reauthorization Acts 2007 and 2010. Graduate, uh, she uh, holds degrees from Texas A&M University and the University of Kentucky. Uh, she started out her life um, working as assistant professor of history at St. Mary's University of Minnesota. Um, she started her Hill career working for Congressman Hall in 2003 as an LA deputy communications director and eventually legislative director. As staff director, she uh, managed a staff of 47 people with a budget of uh, nearly seven million and under her jurisdiction, uh, she focused on uh, programs at NASA, NSF, NIST, NOAA, EPA, Departments of Energy, Homeland Security, and Transportation. So, Greg, the floor is yours. Well, I'll keep this brief. Um, this is the first time David's ever introduced me and said I wasn't raised by kangaroos, so thank you, uh, David. It's very kind of you. Um, I want to thank the George Marshall Institute, the Space in, uh, Enterprise Council for hosting this event. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here to discuss what I believe is, is almost certainly the most important national security issue facing Congress right now, facing our nation right now. Folks, look, I'm not here to bash the White House or Congress or, because I've only got an hour. So uh, we'll, we'll just sort of skate over that for the minute. I'm a reserve officer just to uh, get it out there in the open in the United States Navy, served in Afghanistan, as David said. 
uh, and continue to serve. Uh, I also had the honour to serve as an officer in the Royal Australian Navy. But I want to emphasise that I'm not here to speak on behalf of the United States Navy, and uh, because this will get back, no doubt, and I just want to put that little caveat in there. Um, in the course of my day-to-day -day role with Tech America, I'm fortunate to interact with some very senior folks, be it military, the letter agencies, government, and of course here on the Hill with staff and, uh, and uh, elected members. Recently, I had the good fortune and the honour to speak with the Commandant of the US Marine Corps. He spoke to me about the risk of the Marine Corps becoming a hollow force. And I think this uh, fear, this risk of a hollow force is being felt right across all branches of the US government, be it uniformed military, civilian agencies, uh, or intelligence agencies. You know, today there is basically just too much uncertainty about the future of our military, our defence industrial base and our space industrial base. Here in Washington, as we discuss endlessly debate and debate the impact of sequestration, it's important that we not lose sight of what actually matters in this debate. The most important constitutional responsibility of the federal government is to protect the American people and provide for the common defence. To protect the American people and provide for the common defence. When our young men and women raise their right hand and swear to support and defend the Constitution, they do so with the expectation that the Congress and the President of the United States will give them the resources and will give them the tools they need to protect themselves and accomplish their missions. Yet under current law, defence sequestration will take effect in less than six months, or, or may well take effect in less than six months. If Congress neglects its constitutional responsibilities and allows sequestration to move forward, we will cause enormous damage to our armed forces, cede the lead in space and make our country less safe in a way that no enemy could ever hope to do. We'll be breaking faith with the men and women who wear the uniform at Camp Lejeune, at the Kennedy Space Centre or in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. We will be breaking that solemn, bond, that solemn bond. The more we deprive our troops of the tools they need, the more likely conflict uh, will, will happen, the more likely it becomes putting our troops in increased danger of being killed or injured and uh, when that next conflict pops up. It's really just that simple. It's, it's, it's not rocket science and that's probably a good place to talk about rocket science. Secretary Panetta and the service chiefs have been clear regards sequestration. And remember, Secretary Panetta is uh, appointed by the White House, this White House. Secretary Panetta has warned that the cuts of this magnitude would be devastating, catastrophic and would inflict severe damage on our national defence for generations to come. In fact, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, recently testified that sequestration would reduce our advantages over potential enemies, diminish deterrence and, to quote him, increase the likelihood of conflict. To increase the likelihood of conflict. And that's a direct quote from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Now, this is something that lawmakers really need to consider as we move forward, as we continue to wrangle over who did what to whom and who has the biggest stick. And I did say stick in that, uh, just so we're clear. Um, to understand why our military leaders here are so concerned, we need to appreciate what the impacts are, will, are on our individual military services, our intelligence capabilities, as well as on our defence and space industrial base. And please be, be very clear about this. NASA's mission is among the non-defence related uh, activities that will be targeted and severely impacted by uh, sequestration. NASA Administrator Mr Charles Bolden said, and I quote him here, we're not planning for sequestration and we're not budgeting for sequestration. He went on to say that I don't think about sequestration because I don't think it's going to happen. Now that's a refrain we've heard all over Capitol Hill uh, over the last six months. And like many members of Congress and folks in the White House, Mr Bolden stuck his proverbial head in the proverbial sand over sequestration. Unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, sequestration is more than likely to happen uh, as we move forward. The Congressional Budget Office uh, estimated that cuts to non-defence discretionary spending, the category that includes NASA, would amount to 7.8% in 2013 alone. NASA's 2012 budget, which was uh, enacted back uh, on November the 18th, uh, it's 17.8 billion currently. A 7.8% cut would leave NASA with less than $16.5 billion for 2013. The Pentagon's budget, of course, would be hit even harder. Now, the prospect of such deep across-the-board spending cuts has seen folks at NASA, in Congress and across government 
uh, finally wake up a little bit. And the, but the question is now, is it, is it just too late? In total, the legislation manda mandates 1.7 trillion in federal spending uh, reductions from defence, non-defence and Medicare budgets. That's over the next 10 years. In a letter to Senator McCain, Secretary Panetta said that cuts would leave our nation with the smallest ground force since 1940, the smallest number of ships since 1915 and the smallest air force in history. And let's, uh, much to Joel's chagrin here, let's look briefly at each of those services because he's heard this 500 times. In addition to the pending reduction of 72,000 soldiers, the Army Chief of Staff has said the Army would be forced to cut an additional 100,000 troops, and that will come primarily out of the Reserve and Guard forces. Uh, this means that thousands of well-performed uh, soldiers returning from deployment will be literally fired the minute they get off that aeroplane. And uh, I can say from personal experience, I had sailors that were given their uh, don't come Monday slips while we were still in theatre, and it's a pretty gut-wrenching uh, experience when you have to sit, sit down a 21-year-old uh, petty officer and tell him that he doesn't have a job when he returns from Afghanistan. It's a, it's a, it really is the essence of breaking faith with our men and women in uniform. The Marine Corps, which is already slated to cut 20,000 Marines from the active duty force, is facing an additional reduction of approximately 18,000. The Assistant Commandant said recently that cuts of this magnitude would render the Marines incapable of conducting a single major contingency operation. Now that's pretty disturbing. The CNO, or Chief of Naval Operations, recently testified that the Navy would cut between 50 and 55 ships from a fleet that is already short of its 313 uh, number required for, for operations. Now slashing the Navy would also make a mockery of the President's renewed focus on the Asia-Pacific region and send a destabilising message to our allies in the region who confront an ascendant and increasingly aggressive China. For the Air Force, the problems are even bigger. They'll probably have to close some golf clubs and uh, some, of the, um, some of their country clubs. Uh, I hope there's none of my Air Force friends here today. Uh, but one of their real other top priorities, apart from keeping those open, uh, would be modernisation programs like the Joint Strike Fighter and the uh, KC-46 Supertanker. Now, cancellation or restructuring of these contracts would have a devastating ripple effect throughout the defence and space industrial base. Just one final point to wrap up. As General Dempsey said, sequestration cuts are going to fall squarely on modernisation, maintenance and training across defence, intelligence and space. Now, you know, those areas are critical ingredients for someone that wants to be a world leader or keep their, their, keep their uh, place as world leader. An insufficient investment in those areas creates a hollow force and puts our national security and, uh, very, very importantly, the lives of our troops at risk. You know, we can't really wait until the election to stop these cuts. Congress, in a, in a perfect world, would act now. The lame duck session may very well be too late because, as we all know, January 2nd, 2013, the axe just falls, and not wanting to be too dramatic about it, that's actually what happens. That's a fact. Washington needs to pony up and show that they have half the courage that our troops have shown in the field. Congress can do better. Unfortunately, at this stage in the game, I'm not actually optimistic they will do better. Uh, thank you again for having me here today, and I look forward to taking uh, some of your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, I appreciate it. My name is Joel Ahrens. I'm the chairman of Veterans for a Strong America. Um, our organization just celebrated its uh, 85th thousandth person signing up for membership in our organization. Um, recently, we've been uh, very critical of the president taking uh, uh, over making uh, or taking overzealous credit for the takedown of uh, Osama bin Laden instead of uh, giving credit where we thought it was due with the uh, the uh, SEAL Team 6 and Naval Special Warfare operators. But one of the other fights that we're also engaged in now as a result of this president and frankly Congress is sequestration. The voice of the warfighter has been silenced throughout this whole fight. We've seen fairly bold statements on the part of uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta talking about this being a meat axe. We're even seeing the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Education now getting involved in it because sequestration will cut some of those domestic programs as well. Um, it's our point of view that it's time for Harry Reid and the Senate Democrats to stop holding the American military and the American economy hostage. 
We didn't need tax increases last year. We didn't need more revenue last year in order to uh, pass continuing resolution to fund the military. We don't need it this year. And let's remember this. Sequest first of all, two things about sequestration. Number one, it was a severe abdication of Congress's responsibility to the military, to the American public. They didn't have to create a special committee to come up with a budget or budget cuts in order to fund the military. They should have done it through the regular congressional budgetary process. Fact of the matter is they didn't want to be held responsible. I think two things. Number one, it was short-sighted on the part of Republicans. And number two, it was deceptive on the part of Democrats. Frankly, I think President Obama scored a win with this sequestration process. Let's also remember this, the second thing. This whole process is based on the premise of budget reduction or deficit reduction. But here's the problem. The one-sixth uh, uh, of the cuts that will be taken from the military, or excuse me, military budget right now about $600 billion. We're going to take $100 billion a year out of it for the next 10 years. Where are we seeing those savings? We're not. The federal budget deficit is going to continue to rise. So what we're seeing from this administration, uh, they're continuing to use the military budget to fund other non-discretionary, non-defense programs. Also, they've refused to uh, engage in entitlement reform. And the reason, and just let me make this side note about the national deficit being a national security threat, when we don't have the dollars or the ability um, to project force out into the world because we have to spend those dollars on entitlement programs, we have a national security problem. Now, we've all heard the talking points. They all boil down to the following. The smallest force structure in the modern era. Smallest Navy since 1915, smallest Air Force in history. Marine Corps will no longer have the ability to conduct full-scale amphibious assault missions anymore. They just won't. They won't have the amphibious assault vehicles to do it. Also, we're going to see the smallest ground force we've seen since before World War II. But as a veteran, what I want to give you today is a boots-on-the-ground perspective of what these cuts mean to the warfighters on the ground. And I want to do this by discussing three distinct issues. And one of them revolves around special operations missions. And I don't want to steal any of Steve's thunder here. But uh, I'm going to talk about naval special warfare, not Army. That's OK with you. Um, almost a year ago today, August 6, 2011, 22 SEALs and eight other troops lost their lives when a CH-47 Chinook was shot down by the Taliban. Now, what happened in that incident is because the special warfighters, Navy SEAL Team 6, normally they fly around in what's called an MH-47 Chinook. An MH-47 has more horsepower, longer capabilities, increased avionics, it has all of the capabilities and then some of a CH-47. At this time right now, we only have 61 MH-47 Chinooks in the entire uh, military inventory. 20 of those are in theater right now, and the rest are back here in the United States and arrayed around the world on training and maintenance missions. And so because of the budget cuts, we had to send 22 Navy SEALs into a hot LZ, which the Taliban controlled, with a, with a helicopter that they don't normally conduct those types of missions with. And because they, it, let me take a step back. The kind of dynamic, bold missions that special warfighters conduct means that they don't land their helicopters like a normal conventional military unit would, like on a football field, which is being protected by other conventional forces. SEAL Team 6, a year ago, went into a hot LZ, and they go in at a different pitch, in a different angle, at a different speed. And what they were forced to do is they were forced to go into that LZ with a helicopter that could not conduct that mission properly. 
And so what happens is it also didn't have the kind of armor plating on it that a normal MH-47 would. And so what happens is the Taliban shot out the back end of it and caused one of the, the greatest loss of life in the special operations community to date. And that's just one example of where continuing budget pressures are forcing us to have to restrict the ability of warfighters to fight their missions. Let me give you some insight into the number of missions that Naval Special Warfare is conducting right now. In 2009, they were conducting 54 missions a month. In 2010, they're conducting 186 missions a month. In 2011, they're fighting 334 missions a month, and they're doing that with the same 20 helicopters. If sequestration goes into effect, which it probably will, given the political climate right now, there will be no more helicopters available for naval special warfare or the rest of the special operations community, for that matter, to be able to conduct those missions. Furthermore, there has been talk that the special operations community is somewhat insulated. The problem with that is they'll still receive the kind of training, uh, training dollars that they're going to be able to, to, to train themselves with, but they're not going to see the kind of infrastructure dollars that they get from uh, being able to use more helicopters and more kinds of transportation assets. The second thing I want to talk about uh, that puts a human face on sequestration is the fact that 200,000 troops will be laid off. We're going to see troop reductions in all of the armed services, and uh, what we're also going to lose as a result of that is some of the most seasoned, hardened combat veterans that we have. Now, there's no price that can be put on, or there's no dollar amount that we can tag onto what a seasoned captain who's able to lead troops um, has and the impact that he has on the unit dynamic and being able to lead, tr lead troops into combat. There's no dollar amount or no price tag that we can put on a sergeant first class in the Army being able to lead a platoon or petty officer in the Navy. We're going we're gonna to have a brain and a brawn drawn in the military. Now, clearly the impact, or the impact is evident that it'll have in the militaries. We're going to lose seasoned fighters um, who know how to lead their units. What we're going to see in the civilian marketplace, though, is 200,000 people dumped on the dumped on the unemployment rules. And so what that creates is right now we have about 9.2 percent employment amongst uh, returning veterans. What we'll see with the total impact of sequestration is we'll probably see that rise by another percent. Also, what I think is interesting, one thing we want to point out, the Obama administration wants to spend one billion dollars on a veterans job corps. Now, this Veterans Job Corps would take that $1 billion and it would employ 20,000 veterans. That's about 50,000 veterans. It's about $50,000 per veteran. What we could do with that $1 billion is we could keep 50,000 troops employed in the military for another year as well. Now, sure, it's about priorities. The Obama administration wants to maybe work on employing veterans in jobs like, which are similar to the Civilian Conservation Corps. They want more park rangers, more park police, um, more uh, National Park Service employees. That really is the thrust of the, of the Veterans Job Corps program. They want more people working to do kind of environmental reconstruction projects. So voters are going to have a choice. They're either going to decide, do we want that $1 billion spent to employ 20,000 veterans, or should we maintain the current budget, avoid sequestration, and keep some of the most seasoned combat-hardened troops employed within the military? The last thing I'll talk about very quickly is force readiness. And what that is, that's Pentagon speak for training dollars. Training dollars go towards making sure that Navy SEALs have gas in their helicopter or fuel in their helicopters, bullets in their guns, time to go to the range, time to engage in the type of you know, manpower intensive training it takes to maintain those perishable skills that uh, they're kind of soft perishable skills that troops need to be able to 
execute their missions on the ground. And those skills are incredibly perishable. And so we need to maintain the training dollars in order to maintain our levels of proficiency, being able, you know, being able to shoot straight and walk right. What we're going to see right now, the, the Pentagon's request was for $137 million for FY13. Uh, Post-sequester, that dollar amount drops down to $96 million. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a reduction in all of the training capabilities that we've had um, because of the, the reduction in dollars. Less training exercises, less shooting on the ranges, less um, uh, field training exercises and those kinds of activities that normally we need in order to maintain our proficiency. So uh, I want to thank the George C. Marshall Institute for the opportunity to be here today. They've made a profound impact on national security and defense studies uh, here in the Capitol and, and uh, look forward to taking your questions afterwards. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, I have to tell you, I spent several years doing cybersecurity for IBM, and I was always on panels with very learned Air Force types, and I used to always start by saying, well, I might not be as smart as those guys, but I'm probably the only guy on the panel that knows how to kill people with his hands. Uh, unfortunately, in this panel, I'm not the only one, so, you know, it's a little different. Uh, I have to, I'm, I'm a little older than my two colleagues. Uh, I was commissioned in, in the Army in 1977 when I graduated from the military academy uh, and joined what was, at the time, a very hollow army post-Vietnam, right? The volunteer army had just been started, or volunteer military had just started, and it wasn't working very well yet. Uh, it was a difficult time, and the army managed and the military managed to build itself out of that uh, hole. Uh, and get ourselves ready and actually be proficient in time for Desert Storm. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on one's point of view, that was also right when, you know, we had some other things going on in the world. We had post-Cold War, uh, and we had in the Army, they called it the build down. The military is very good on coming up with totally absurd buzzwords like that, because you don't build down anything. Uh, so, and we frankly had another hollow force for a while. And then we started fixing things again and uh, trying to get ready. And fortunately, uh, we weren't quite rebuilt in time for 9-11, but we got on the horse real fast and, and put together what has turned out to be, once we've incorporated in all of the reserve components, uh, probably one of the, the most effective fighting forces this country's ever had, particularly on, you know, on a relatively small scale. Uh, but I have to tell you, this time, and you know, historically, every time it's post-conflict, everybody wants to save money, everybody wants a peace dividend, everybody thinks you're gonna fix all the economic woes of a country by just not spending money on that darn defense stuff. But it hasn't ever worked. Uh, we always end up being in a position where We've taken a chance, we've, we've accepted risk, and we end up getting burned. And sometimes we get burned very badly, or at least the young men and women who have to go out and try and fight under those less than ideal conditions when somebody does do something to us, uh, they get burned. And to be honest with you, it doesn't ever fix the economy. So uh, with that as a start, I'm gonna give you three main points two of which are very applicable to defense and also to other parts of the government, because I know there's some folks here not just worried about uh, how sequester is going to affect defense, but how it's going to affect uh, the space business, which is not all connected with defense. Uh, and then another point that should concern you just as citizens in the country, regardless of where you're from or what kind of business you're in. Um, the first point is that, frankly, the sequestration it's just bad policy. Right? It's not, even if you put aside the politics and who did what to whom and who won the argument when they passed the, uh, the Budget Control Act, uh, it's just really, really poor policy. It's poor leadership or lack of leadership on a lot of people's parts, and it's just not the way you do budgeting. Particularly in the defense business, you're supposed to decide what your priorities are 
and then figure out what you need to accomplish those priorities and then budget for it. I understand we've got restrictions. Well, then you take that list of things you do or you need to do and you start applying the money you have to those highest priorities and the ones at the lower levels get dropped off. We haven't done that. We've just decided we're going to pick a number and that's what we're going to go for and military, you figure out how to do whatever you can do with what's left. That's really, really dumb business, dangerously dumb. Uh, and frankly, it's coming from people who know better. Now, defense has accepted almost a half a trillion dollars in cuts under Secretary Gates, his efficiencies. And theoretically, those were done with some uh, deliberative process, with some study and, and thought. Uh, and everybody in the military said, got it, boss, we can do these. We can keep doing our job despite these. Well, then the Budget Control Act passed, and Secretary Panetta essentially as tranche one under the Budget Control Act directed nearly another half a trillion dollars in cuts to be applied over the next 10 years. And again, at least on the surface, I'm not in the Pentagon anymore, so I don't, you know, I haven't seen the actual specific process, but all the uniforms have stood up before Congress and the public and said, yeah, we can live with these cuts. We can still do our job despite these things. It's going to be tough, but we can do it. Well, now we have another half trillion about to hit, just in the defense part, not even counting what's going to hit the rest of the economy, uh, and nobody's saying they can accept it. Everybody, including the people that President Obama appointed, are saying this is not just going to be a problem, it's devastating. And we keep rolling towards that cliff. This is kind of the equivalent of trying to do surgery with a blind man in a crowded room with a sword. Right? It's just really, really bad policy. Okay, enough preaching. Point two, the defense budget in particular is not a jobs program. All right? It isn't there to keep people employed. Uh, even even the, the guys and gals in uniform. Right? That's not the purpose of, of why you spend defense dollars. If you start cutting those dollars, it does have an effect that a whole bunch of those kids are now going to be out of work and people connected with them, people that sell them stuff are going to be out of work, but that's not the reason you spend defense dollars. However, when you look at the defense industrial base, and this does apply to any of you that are here for the, the space component of this because some of them are the same people, uh, you start firing those folks and it isn't like you can go down to the 7-Eleven and pick up a couple of day workers and replace them. All right, these are highly skilled workers, people who have clearances, in some cases multiple clearances, and if you close down what they do and fire them, you don't get them back right away. We spoke to one fella, his company does the maintenance for some ICBM sites that are owned by the Air Force. And we asked him, because he said at the end of this year, the end of this calendar year, his contract runs out. And we said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I can't do anything until somebody offers me another contract. There's nothing I can do at the end of the year. I've got to start laying people off with the WARN Act notices that, that are there. Uh, and <coughs> one of my colleagues asked this guy, he said, well, hypothetically, let's say you lose those people for six months. You have to fire them and you can't hire them back again for six months. How long will it take you to fully reconstitute your workforce? His answer was three years. Now you're sitting there saying, well, why would it take three years? Well, because, no offense to the state of Montana where this occurred, but those really highly skilled, multiple cleared, PRP cleared folks, PRP has to do with the nuclear program, are not gonna sit around in Montana and draw on employment and wait to get rehired. They're going to go somewhere else and get hired by someone doing some other job. And then you got to find them again and you got to clear them again and you have to do all that, that stuff because once you walk out of a job like that, at least the, the SCI parts of your clearance, the PRP parts disappear. Right? Your, your regular base clearance stays until its term runs out, but those other uh, additional things are lost immediately when you walk out of the position. That's just the way the, the law works. So 
there is going to be an enormous loss of skilled workers that are part of our defense industrial base that it's, it's going to be really, really hard to recoup without a significant uh, cut in time. Uh, this will bounce through the space community and some of the other security related but not exactly defense uh, communities because you're going to lose some of those same people. Um, the last one which is really more of an interest to you as citizens is that when these cuts hit, and, and Greg kind of mentioned this, and I guess Joel <coughs> did too, a lot of these cuts are going to hit into the National Guard and Reserves. I can tell you, Secretary of the Air Force Donnelly, Mike's a good friend of mine, and he there's a big news story this morning. He was saying, look, we either cut the guard now or we're going to have to cut the guard later. But we're going to have to cut them if we're going to absorb these kind of losses. You start cutting the Air and Army National Guard, and it doesn't matter whether you have a federal facility in your state or not, you are affected by this. And that means when your governor turns around because there's a flood or a wildfire or some other disaster in your state, and he's looking for the assets he needs to respond to that, they're not there. Or at least they're not there in the numbers and the capabilities that they used to be. And that's going to affect everybody around here. Um, are there potential other efficiencies in defense that could be made beyond what have been made already? Yes, there are. But I have to tell you, they are not the kind of changes that are amenable to this big sort of salami slice reductions that that uh, the sequestration will cause. They're the kind of changes that have to be made with very specific legislation uh, that targets things like the defense acquisition and procurement system, the redundancy within the military, you know, like multiple medical systems and, and that sort of thing, the clearance system, which I've sort of alluded to. There's a lot of really inefficient things in the Department of Defense that can be fixed and save some money, but this is not going to affect them. All right, this solution will not cure the disease as far as the Department of Defense. This solution will also not cure the disease of fixing the economy. In fact, if anything, this solution will probably adversely affect our economy uh, rather than help it. And the key to this is that our leaders need to start acting like leaders. All right? The President and the Senate Majority Leader have accused the Republicans of playing politics with defense. And if that's not the pot calling the kettle black, I've never seen anything like it because that's exactly what the President and the Senate Majority Leader are doing. They have said without any doubt that they're not going to even consider a solution that doesn't raise taxes. Right now, Mr. Reed would be thrilled for this train to go off the cliff because he'd like to see those cuts in defense anyway, and he can't get the votes to do it. And if they find a way to fix it, uh, you know, he either gets raises in taxes or cuts in defense, either one, and he's happy with both. And uh, unfortunately, and apparently so is the president, despite his role as the commander in chief. Uh, so right now, keep in mind, this is gonna be devastating. It is not just gonna affect the Department of Defense. It's going to affect a lot of the ancillary uh, functions, a lot of the other departments that the, sec that the Department of Defense assists with its capabilities that it will no longer be able to do, like helping the Department of Homeland Security, like helping the intel community, because it's not going to have the assets with which to do it. And you as citizens are not going to have as much response capability to come to your assistance uh, when that disaster strikes very, very close to home. So I will stop with that, and I guess one of you are going to moderate? Yeah. All right. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for that, for those introductory opening comments. <coughs> Before I open uh, to the rest of the floor <coughs> for questions, uh, a thought that I'd like to get your reactions to. So if we're in general agreement that I think the salami cut is, is the best illustration of, uh, of this, if we're in agreement that that's probably not the best way to make policy uh, or to budget, how do we prioritize amongst the, the various capabilities that, that, you've all, that you've talked about from in, ensuring that uh, Special Operations Forces have the right equipment and the right capabilities and the right uh, amount of training time, et cetera, to 
the large capital investments that need to be made, ships and airplanes and, and those types of things, to properly sizing the force structure to the, the topic that, that we're most interested in, uh, in for this panel discussion, or what motivated it, which is investments in the long run uh, national security space uh, equipment that we need, satellites, the ground stations, things for whom there are, really is no direct constituency aside from advocates and, and, and folks like us. But in terms of prioritizing uh, amongst those investment priority areas, it, it seems to me, I think, a, a fairly easy case to make that those things that are long run, those things that are more, that are characterized as research and development, those things that have an investment payoff that's amortized over decades are the ones that get cut first. Uh, and you, you have more visual and visceral cases that can be made to maintain uh, investments in the human capital and in the rapid response capabilities. And, and I don't mean to undermine or discount the importance of those things, but, but there are, in all things, balance is required. But I, so I'd ask you uh, to respond, to react to that, to that lead in. What kind of balance should we have in the environment that we now face? Set aside sequestration and just say, looking forward, where we probably are operating in an environment with constrained defense resources or limits on defense resources, where do we put those investments in those capital capabilities versus human capabilities versus training, et cetera? Well, the, the key is, you know, we can't have any sacred cows, right? We, we, we cannot sit and, and decide we're going to do things the way we've always done it. I mean, this is the kind of really painful exercise that we have to go through. You know, and, and don't misunderstand me, and I tried to emphasize, you know, it's not that DOD shouldn't even have any more cuts above but what they've gotten, uh, but God, everybody knows our government writ large is full of inefficiencies, but, you know, this legislator wants to defend these programs, and this legislator wants to defend those programs. And, you know, leadership's painful. Leadership is about making tough decisions that you then have to suffer the slings and arrows of, of uh, your constituents if you make those tough decisions. Well, we're at that point in our country economically where our leaders need to make some of those tough decisions. They chose a route with the Budget Control Act that is a complete cop-out. If I was a leader and one of my subordinate leaders came up with a solution like that, I'd fire him. You know, yesterday Senator Graham said it at another meeting, he said, you know, this shouldn't be about firing soldiers to fix the economy, it should be about firing all of us here in, this, in the Capitol building. You know, respectfully, you're darn right, Senator, that ought to be what happens. Uh, that said, these are the leaders we've got, and instead of for cheap political reasons or for getting an outcome that you can't get through the normal the legislative process, uh, we can't let this one ride. It was a really, really crappy decision. And, and you know, a pox on everybody who signed it. it, it they were all wrong. Uh, but the leaders need to sit down as the leaders of this country and make tough decisions and go through line by line, not just the defense budget, but the entitlements and everything else, and make some serious, painful cuts. I would venture that some of our leaders have looked across the Atlantic Ocean and said, gee, that's terrible, those poor Greeks and the Spaniards, they really need to tighten their belts and do the right things. Well, you know what, we should too. And that's gonna hurt some people, but we need to do it but we need to protect our country and, and we need to kind of rein in our appetites. Uh, but it isn't going to be done with a big, sweeping, easy solution. And that's what the BCA was, or at least they thought it was, and it's turned out to be a big, sweeping <laughs> hairball that we're all trying to swallow. What are we going to go with that? Yeah, it's, I'm well, going to be hit. It's, uh, uh, Stephen's entirely right, and I think one of the things that uh, we, I don't think any of us touched on, certainly Leslie didn't, um, <laughs> is that these cuts are across the board. We're not looking at cuts where we can go to some of these programs that need to be cut. We can't say, well, we need to take 10% off our $1.7 trillion or whatever it is, but we've got all these old legacy programs that can go. This goes off the top of every single program, whether it's JSF, whether it's 
uh, missile systems, whatever the case may be, whether it's new helicopters, it gets, gets taken off the top. What this does is creates a lack of critical mass. So if you have a program that all of a sudden loses 10% of its funding, it loses 10% of its brain power, it loses 10% of everything, and all of a sudden that program, <coughs> while it's only losing 10%, is at risk of going away, whether it's a space program, whether it's a defence program, whether it's a homeland security program, or whether it's a Medicare program, it goes away because that 10% affects the critical mass so badly. Stephen did touch a bit on Britain, uh, or on Europe. You know, Britain in the 70s went through this exact same situation where they cut back their uh, defence spending so drastically that their national security became a major issue for them. And it took them decades uh, and the kick in the butt that was the Falklands to get things back on track. So, I mean, given the current geopolitical climate, I mean, there's a lot of kicks in the butts out there that uh, could potentially happen to us, and, and that's why it's such a big issue. Well, I've heard the uh, BCA called many things before. I've never heard it called a hairball, but uh, um, yeah, look, it, you bring up several different issues in your question. First of all, it's about political willpower. Political willpower, frankly, is determined by the voters, and I think this election will determine where BCA goes. It, it won't be uh, leaders in Congress. Sure, we may see some activity um, in a lame duck session uh, in order to avert uh, some type of short-term uh, budgetary issues that uh, will happen as a result of cuts on January 2nd. But I think furthermore we should take a page out of uh, Ronald Reagan's administration. Uh, what we saw during the Reagan administration was him and Tip O'Neill sit down over drinks and they figured out um, uh, they figured out the defense spending issue. And actually we saw a very robust uh, defense strength and it wasn't an issue of priorities then um, looking at the military, looking at defense spending in a vacuum. Between those two and during the Reagan administration, it was an issue of priorities in the federal budget overall. And that's where we have to go this time around as well. It isn't an issue, back then it was SDI, 400 ship Navy, manpower training, as well as beefing up the nuclear triad. We did all of that in the 1980s. We're not even looking at anything near those, times, those ter type, types of dollars in terms of today's dollars, in terms of the kind of investment that we need to keep. We're only looking at $100 billion a year right now. Um, and so I think we look to the Reagan administration uh, uh, for the kind of ability that the president, as well as Democrat leaders in Congress had in the 1980s with the ability to, uh, you know, granted it was a Cold War scenario then, but today it's, uh, it's more than a Cold War. We're in a hot war today. We have live rounds flying downrange at real people. We have real IEDs going off. Uh, we have real terrorists blowing up real people. And so there's even a more immediate urgency uh, to some of these budgetary issues because what gets decided in this building affects what happens in Helmand Province. It affects what happens in Baghdad. affects what happens in Afghanistan. Well, I think Joel's answer then would be that you invest in the near term boots on the ground capabilities and the things that folks would need. I'm curious what the rest of the panel thinks, though, about the relative balance in investment in future capability or hardware slash supplementary systems, which space is rightly considered as. Well, do, we, well, do, we, do we support those? Obviously, you'll support them, but where where should the cuts that come either under sequestration or not not under sequestration but looking forward if we were to recognize a rebalancing of defense investment how does it balance out from should it balance to current capability should it balance to future capability should it balance in favor of investment in those supplementary hardware capabilities you, you've got it you've got to maintain a, a balance between them. I mean, we have to have a today capability because, as you said, the, the war isn't over. It's not like everybody's back home. Uh, we're still fighting the war, and, and more could come at any minute because th this is not, you know, it's not a very Pacific world out there. We've got just as many threats, you know, of different sizes and different sorts as, as we did prior to 9-11. Uh, so we have to maintain that today kind of capability uh, but th that forward-looking stuff is what enables what we do today. So we can't totally give that away and cut that out completely. 
you know, our ability to, to utilize the, the, the advantages we have in satellite technology, the, the, the whole cyber world, all those things are what makes our military today as effective as it is. It isn't just, you know, the guys with the big thick necks and, and who can shoot real straight. I mean, God bless them, those are my people. But the, uh, there, it's more, there's more to it than that. It's, you know, our logistical capability is what makes America a superpower, frankly because nobody else can get where we can go with all the stuff that we can get there with. Uh, but if you start losing all that, that continually evolving capability like space, uh, we're, we're going to lose that stuff too. So there's got to be a balance struck between those, those two things. It's not an either or. If it is an either or, we're going to lose one way or another. Yeah, I, look, I, the issue here, and Steve uh, um, was much more lucid about than I will be, no doubt, but the the issue here is that, you know, the U.S. now enjoys a, you know, we're, we're putting platforms out there that attack four-level platforms. The rest of the world is at sort of TAC-3, TAC-2 in some cases. Now, if we don't have a forward-looking process here, if we don't keep investing in, in development, all of a sudden that, that um, um, uh, lead we have over every other country on the face of the earth goes away and it'll go away very very quickly i mean you see the chinese and the russians copying everything and the iranians copying everything they can get their hands on now if we all of a sudden don't invest and look forward whilst at the same time time maintaining a a, a, a pertinent force we're going to go from having that lead of a of a, of a level a level or in, in many cases two levels to being on parity with a lot of these um, countries and that will happen remarkably quickly, I'm talking in a decade as opposed to 20 or 30 years. It, it will be very, very fast. I would just take issue slightly with your characterization of my comments, just in the sense that, um, you know, if we go back to the Reagan playbook, I, I think what we did is we, we did see the kind of um, investment in both long-term infrastructure um, as well as uh, short-term immediate needs. Um, the biggest recipient of space-based technologies was guys like me. Right. Um, I had not only GPS technology, which is you know, incredibly basic today, I was a recipient of something called Blue 4 Tracker. You know, it's literally this TV set or computer that sits in your Humvee and you can see where all forces are arrayed on the battlefield around you. you know, you're watching the fight in virtual real time. And so I could see where my fellow platoon leaders were um, and where my company commander was and where the units are on the battlefield and where the bad guys were. And uh, that's all space-based technology. We're using satellites in order to move this information around the battlefield. And uh, additionally, I was able to text message through this system, you know, my fellow platoon leader to tell them, look, I mean, we need to, you know, we need to move north because that's where the enemy is being flushed out right now and those types of things. And so I think the war fighters today are, have been and are the recipients of some of the best space technology you've seen developed over the last 20, 25 years. Good. Well, I'm glad I mischaracterized you then. Because I got the right, I got an can, answer. I, I, can I, I say one, one more thing about <laughs> yeah, that? Sure. The, you know, I, we have to be careful. I mean, I'm, I'm, I spent 28 years as a special operations guy, and they are the most incredible people in the world, guys and gals today, by the way. Uh, they are getting a lot of press because this particular president has used them a lot, has used them effectively, frankly. But you need to understand something. They are special, as one of my colleagues said, but they are not magical, right? They don't replace battles, you know, aircraft carriers and fighter planes and main battle tanks and all that other stuff. They can do a lot of things, but all through history, elite forces like that have been used for things that were not terribly appropriate, and all you do is have a lot of dead, well-trained, really elite people but they're just as dead, all right? So the, it seems like a cheap solution. Well, we can get by with 12 guys instead of, you know, several hundred. Uh, you can do a lot of things with those 12 guys, but they don't replace infantry divisions or, or you know, um, marine amphibious groups. Uh, so drones and special operations 
you, you got to have more than that, folks, if you're going to have um, national defense. Uh, we like to puff up our chests and wear our berets inside the bars just like everybody else. But uh, they are not a panacea for all the defense challenges that this country faces. So don't, don't get down the trail of let's find a cheap solution for it. You need all that stuff. You need satellites. You need, you know, JWACs. You, you need all that kind of pricey, high-tech stuff or those guys on the ground are not as effective as they would be otherwise. Like nowhere near as effective. When you create a lot of downward pressure on special operations, when you don't have conventional forces to back them up. And what we're seeing in today's kind of dynamic, asymmetrical environment is this uh, kabuki dance between conventional forces and special forces or special operations. And so you need both of those in order to dominate the battlefield. Gil? I, I just have a question for everybody. I'm trying to get my head around um, what the, the likely scenario is going downstream. Uh, the Hill is likely, with, with any luck, to, uh, to appropriate fiscal year 13 funds. Let's say they do that by the October deadline. Um, and so there will be a 13 budget that will be start to be implemented at that particular point. Now, how does sequestration impact that should that come about? Is that just a percentage cut, as you was mentioned here, on each program? that then will affect that 50, uh, fiscal year 13 appropriations, or, or, or how's that executed? I'm going to reach into my magic pocket that I have <laughs> here, and I'm going to pull out an answer for you. Because the answer you get from that is the same you're going to get from this administration. They're not going to tell you. We have Congress right now passing a bill to force the administration to tell you what sequestration is going to look like. We don't know. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how the executive branch is going to carry out BCA at this point. And so I think you bring up a good question. These gentlemen may have better insight on it than me, but I think at this point we've created a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure on uh, the military, and uh, I'm very interested in what it's going to look like because if we don't know now, how do we shape our strategic Right now, the budget is driving our strategic assessment as opposed to the strategic assessment being funded by what we think is important. And so we have dollars driving strategy right now. As Greg said, we can't carry out this new pan-Asian strategy that we want to do with the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like. I don't even think they're going to be able to fund that strategy. I, I, you know, Josh just touched on something. The, the, that legislation that was passed last night, you know, to force you know, the White House or the President to actually lay out what we're doing with sequestration. You know, Obama, to mine, has two options here. He either signs it and signs it into law and actually has to go on record before the election and say what sequestration will do, or he doesn't sign it and he embarrasses himself and sort of shows, you know, I, I can't go into that because this will get back to the Navy or someone. In any case, uh, he has two, those two options, and uh, he's got 30 days to decide, and that's not a very long time frame to do that. I, I, I personally think uh, he won't pony up, um, and you know, you, you talk to any member of Congress or anyone in the military, uh, senior people in the military, and they're not allowed, or not Congress, military, and they're not allowed to talk to you about it because they've been told under threat of whatever they get threatened with that they can't speak about it and they can't plan for it. Now, you can't tell me that the military, which plans for everything, particularly the Army, <laughs> plans for... I had to work with the Army for nine months. That's, that's another story. For, you. for me, yeah. <laughs> you cannot tell me the military is not planning for a hundred billion, you know, billions of dollars in cuts. But that's... Uh, the way my more legally trained colleagues have told me that their reading of the BCA is that right now, it has to be the big salami slice across everything, just the way Greg described it. Uh, there is some talk that, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense has requested, well, if this does happen, you know, give me the authority to cut what I think should be cut so it'll be more um, rational and, and that sort of thing. Some of us are a little concerned about that because there are some programs that, uh, you know, we know this administration doesn't particularly like 
but Congress has, has protected it, like missile defense and things like that, that if you give that sort of carte blanche authority to the Secretary of Defense, he could just cut out all the stuff he doesn't like or that his boss doesn't like. Uh, and I don't think people in, up on here on the Hill are going to be real thrilled with giving them that much authority. Uh, but right now, they're, you know, they're not saying anything. And that's the whole reason that m so many of these defense contractors have said they're going to have to send out thousands and thousands of, of WARN Act uh, layoff notices because they don't know what, what's going to be cut. And if they don't know what's going to be cut, they have to assume anything could be cut. So they've got to warn everybody or they're going to get, you know, run afoul of that law and have to pay fines and, and pay people who they don't have jobs for. Uh, and, you know, they can't do that because they have their responsibility to their shareholders. Uh, you know, that's gotten some of these the legislators sort of in a, in a pickle because they, they don't really like that on 2 November when there's a big activity on the 6th. Uh, but we don't know how it's going to work out. We, you know, we're hoping uh, against hope that, you know, if enough legislators kind of get energized, because frankly, a lot of legislators, you know, this isn't an issue outside of the Beltway right now because, first of all, it's got such a terrible title to it. Nobody knows what in the heck sequestration means. Uh, the, the, there are very few legislators, aside from a few in the House, uh, Congressman Forbes and a few others, who've been making an effort to go out and, and talk to the American public. Very few have gone out there and made this an issue in, in their districts and in their states. Uh, if more of them do that, perhaps there will be some sort of groundswell and, and you can get the, uh, the Senate leadership to, to decide. The House has come up with a solution for how they could address sequestration, at least for this year, and not gut defense uh, and not raise taxes. The President and Mr. Reid have said that's unacceptable. You know, they're not going to allow that kind of solution. Uh, so it, that, again, to emphasize, tells me they either want, they want to raise taxes or they want to cut defense. Um, my guess is they'd love to do both, but they're going to get one or the other under the BCA if something is not done. Uh, and that right now solely rests with the Senate. And Mr. Reid won't even bring it up for consideration and has been very, very open and vehement about his position that he will not allow any solution other than raising of taxes. Questions? In the yellow tie? Thank you. Uh, my name is Conway. I'm with Aerospace Industries Association, where a trade group rep represents a lot of aerospace companies. Um, you talked uh, extensive, all, all three of you talked extensively about uh, effects on uh, military personnel, uh, soldiers with guns in planes. But uh, another issue that's come up is uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of DOD civilian employees um, to the point where they almost outnumber uh, you know, uniform military personnel. So I was just wondering your opinions on uh, what the appropriate uh, measures to be taken to reduce that payroll um, without severely impacting D uh, the DOD's ability to function. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, <laughs> When I was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, I had about 65 people who worked for me uh, in my shop. And of those, 30 were contractors. Now, there's a lot of rules in the federal government about what contractors can do and what are inherently government functions that only full-time government people can do, whether they're civilian or military. But I got to tell you, I mean, at least in the Department of Defense, that's, that's a bunch of hooey. Uh, all those people did basically the same things. They were all action officers. They were all working issues. Uh, and somebody's got to do those things. This administration has gotten rid of a lot of the contractors, and they got hit because they had to hire a whole bunch of extra, you know, government employees because, to be honest with you, a lot of those functions need to be done. Uh, most of those people are doing two and three jobs. So uh, there's not, the, despite what a lot of people say, there isn't like a lot of people sitting around smoking cigars and, and eating big lunches yeah. over in the Pentagon. Most of those people are working pretty darn hard. Uh, are there some efficiencies? Yes, and I kind of alluded very briefly to them in my remarks. There, there are redundancies. You know, we've got multiple services in some cases who all have, you know, they all have doctors except for the Marines. You know, if the Marines, if the Navy doctors can take care of sailors and Marines, 
why can't DOD doctors take care of sailors, Marines, soldiers, and airmen? They're all humans. The color of their clothes doesn't change their physiology. Uh, and there's a lot of things like that where you could get some efficiencies. But again, the, the sequestration cuts are not going to help you with that. They're not even going to drive you to that because a lot of those things are, are set in law. You've got to change some of the legislation to be able to do those sort of things. The whole defense procurement and acquisition system is the most abysmally inefficient and crappy system that anybody has ever invented because nobody invented it. It's about 99,000 different laws and regulations piled on top of each other, most of which conflict with one another, and it wastes tons and tons of money for every dollar that we actually get some benefit from. Uh, you can't change that with sequestration. You got to change a whole bunch of laws to do that. Again, it's going to require some leadership, and it's going to be somebody's ox is going to get gored in that regard. So long, rambling answer. Yeah, the, the, the civilian workforce is going to get hurt as much, if not more, than the guys and gals in uniform. And there's people beyond that, because there's all the, the subcontractors. It's not just the, the big contractors who, you know, the, the, the major federal integrators. Most of those big contracts have hundreds of subcontractors underneath them, some of them down to little mom and pop shops that provide, you know, one piece of an airplane or something like that. And those people are all going to get swept aside when this happens, right? The, the big federal integrators will survive sequestration. They'll tighten their belts. They might even lower their executives' bonuses a little. Uh, but I tell you what, all those little small and medium subcontractors, they're going to get hosed. And a lot of them will go out of business. And that's one of the reasons why I say this, this thing will not, only not, uh, will not only gut defense, it's not going to help the economy. In fact, there'll be, a, there's a lot of evidence, your report, the uh, Center for uh, Security Policies reports, that show this may, in fact, call, have a very, very devastating effect on our economy. And de it'll definitely have a devastating effect on our, our defense industrial base capabilities. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for anybody. Well, no, that's, that's good. I want to thank you for coming out today and for giving us some comments on this very important issue. Uh, we certainly will continue to, to look at it, look uh, at its implications, and assess uh, the meanings for the aerospace industry generally, but also the security space and economic space uh, communities specifically. So everyone go out there and enjoy that great Washington summer, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.